I'm now going to review the 2020 survey. So these results are relatively hot off the press, a couple of months old now. Uh, we had 87 responses, a uh, few down from last year, but last year was very broad. A lot of people really liked it. This was more filling in the gaps and it was more sort of process, geography and stuff. So it's understandable uh, why the numbers were down slightly. We asked, what region is your company based? Uh, so bias this year was definitely more to Europe than it was last year. We had a little bit more North American bias. So it's interesting to see the broader engagement across uh, Europe. I think that in part reflects sort of you the COVID situation, you know, because lockdowns continue and people, you know, they just get a bit tired of trying to do anything other than, you know, the essentials to uh, survive. So I think that sort of, uh, you know, had an impact on how much, how many responses we got from North America. But you can see broad base on all around the world, which is great and exactly what we wanted to see. Then we asked, if your company core team is based in one country, what is that? Here, of course, North America uh, is uh, you know, key, but it's equal to India. India is a growing importance. Uh, now, of course, as we look across you know, the Europe, so uh, and I include UK and Europe, we have Germany, UK, France, uh, you know, Poland, uh, Romania. We see the tentacles of uh, focus uh, in, you, know, you can see in the sort of uh, resumes, the LinkedIn profiles of a lot of the open source leaders, that common experience with uh, focus. So that in part you know, explains why we see Europe as such a center in open source excellence. But you can see you know, there's Brazil, uh, Greece, uh, Australia, New Zealand. But you can see also you know, it's a bit of a bias to English speaking. And again, most of the uh, documentation is in English. So of course that biases to people where English is their native language. Then we looked at what's your main region of operations. I'm sorry that the Europe thing is most really getting cut off by my face. Again, the slides are published so you can review all the numbers uh, on the slides. But again, Europe is the main region of operations, the multi-region uh, North America, followed by the other regions. So even though India was a popular location for the team, they're actually serving generally uh, countries outside of India. So it's just, again, it's uh, important to, to note in terms of how it's structured. Then what are, you, what are the main challenges you're facing in using open source telecoms? So of course, top, finding knowledgeable consultants. I must make a point, it's not just knowledgeable consultants on the specific projects, it's also with SIP expertise uh, and practical SIP expertise. So, and that remains relatively rare. I mean, you can get great, you know, sort of WebRTC uh, experts that understand, you know, all the different flavors, variations, the issues and getting stuff up and running within the browser, but they may not necessarily have the depth you would need in SIP and some of the issues you see with SIP. So I just mentioned that with these projects, it's broader than just knowledge on the specific projects, it's knowledge of SIP as well. And that's, again, it's something I think as an industry, we should do. Speed of response, uh, I, I can't stress enough when, when you're doing something on a project, you, know, you wanna get it done that day. You want ideally an answer in minutes, maybe 20 minutes. Uh, if you have having to wait days, then you're on using something else. And speed of response is essential, uh, making it as easy as possible for people to use your projects to solve problems that they're looking at. Uh, Language is a barrier, uh, documentation. A lot of the people who answer this survey are from the open source community. I mean, it's because the, they're motivated, they want to share uh, you know, what they're doing. Those that aren't, you know, shall we say, core within some of the open source projects, documentation is a big issue for them. I, I mean, I run TadHack, I help companies in engaging a broad range of developers all around the world and documentation is critical. Now, we have an invited keynote from uh, Stephen Goodwin, and he's going to go into more detail around you know, treating documentation like a product, because that's, I see, as a critical barrier for engaging a broader community of developers. And then when we regionalize this, so we look at, well, within the regions, what are the key issues? India, Australia, New Zealand, 
It was speed of response. Russia was language. Central and South America was language barriers. Europe, North America was finding knowledgeable consultants because of course their projects tend to be a little bit bigger. They're looking you know, to hire in skills. So uh, as a result, you're know, finding people with those skills and not just on the specific projects, say free switch, but it's also, you know, as I mentioned, in some of the uh, SIP intricacies, distributed teams in the Middle East against speed of response. So you can see getting answers to questions is critical. Then we looked at you know, how easy or hard it is to hire in country or locally. And here, Europe and America follow the overall curve. In fact, you know, the difficult, no locally available consultants were both, you know, America and Europe had five scores. For the rest of the regions, it was generally threes or four. So as you mentioned, you know, that's what biases the curve. Uh, but again, it gives you a feel for the challenge that we have, that gap in uh, finding people. Then which of the projects? Uh, you know, because again, we had a little bit more of a bias to Europe in the responses. And of course, free switch is a little bit more sort of North American biased in its community. There's a gap, there's a skills gap there, but you can see across OpenSIPs, Camera, Elio, Asterix, you know, there's still, you know, it's challenging to get skills you need on board and not just in the projects, as I mentioned, but also in understanding. So on language barriers, uh, again, Documentation is critical. There's a lot we can do, and that will be discussed separately in the uh, invited keynote from uh, Stephen Goodwin. Uh, Goodwin, sorry, uh, but you know, it must be up to date with the current release. I, I, it, there were several comments where people were making that issue in terms of you know, new releases come out of the open source uh, software, and the documentation wasn't aligned. You know, wasn't up to date. So you know. <laughs> The two have to come out at the same time. You have to treat documentation like a product and it's synced with the uh, software that you're releasing. And you know, it does need a dedicated expert with translation support. You know, Google Translate is not good enough. It doesn't have to be a permanent member of, of your team, but you really do need to make that investment because it will pay back year after year as you bring in more of a community from outside the core open source community. Now, if speed of response from working other time zones is an issue, how useful would be 724? Uh, as you can see, again, broad range, uh, again, the, as you would imagine, America's you know, one to two, so that means that you know, it's no use for them because they're in the same time zone. But you can see with uh, Australia and New Zealand, Middle East, uh, India, definitely you know, being able to get a response in your morning uh, would be uh, very useful. So again, I just highlight, you know, with some of the bigger projects where they can staff up, being able to help people get responses. Now, ideally your documentation should have all the answers. Your community and all the posts that have should have all the answers, but quite often they don't because it's distributed around so many different discussions, so many different documents. You know, a, a simple example. I want to use your SMS API for 2FA. And you know, it should just be a blog post with all the steps from sign up all the way through to here's the code in Go, Curl, you name it. I that's part of the challenge is you know, you know, on the documentation side, and it's never going to be good enough. But you know, there's a lot we can close there. But you can see people are prepared to pay for 724 response. We also asked if you provide consulting to other companies, what do you do? Uh, so you can see it's training development design around your know, VoIP services, WebRTC apps, soft switch services, contact center applications, Asterix, maintaining uh, VoIP networks and services, consulting around general open source software, RTC development, you know, predictive dialing, inbound ADC, PBX, audit services, security. And that's, again, Ole will be presenting it, Ted, some of the Mirror Americas on this. You'll see this is coming through as a theme through TADHack. Uh, looking at open source for call centers, network consulting, RTC design, premise-based architectures. I mean, let's, you know, cloud is not the definitive answer here. In a lot of uh, countries, you know, it, 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 cloud works, but the internet access isn't that great. So, uh, you know, you might want to have something uh, on-prem. Also managed hosted VoIP networks and services, installation, customization, 
high availability, scalability, setups on open source projects, and general telco consulting. Because again, you know, it, it is, we had a few people this time responding that are more in the sort of telco camp, taking open source into telcos. So, you know, I, IMS and Kubernetes, you know, based on Kama Elio, OpenStack, Kubernetes, IC, you know, RTC, open source uh, strategy. And that I see for a lot of telcos is, a, you know, is a gap. So, you know, there's lots of opportunities there for those that focus in on that particular vertical. But you can see there's tons of opportunities for consulting around these projects. One of the questions we asked is, do you plan to reinvest in the open source projects you use? Over 85%, yes. There's always going to be people that, you know, come in, eat your sandwiches and leave. That is, you know, they're not necessarily going to reinvest. But how do they want to? Now, this I found was quite interesting. This was slightly different to what I was expecting. But committing code is top, as you can see. Uh, paying for development, that's surprised me as being so high. Uh, donating money and then attending events or you know, paying for consulting came down a lot lower than I thought. I thought we'd just see attending events being higher. But uh, that again showed to me that you know, having a program that helps people, you know, bring code that they're doing into your project, I think, you know, can you know, provide a significant benefit. Then which client SIP SDK do you use? Uh, you know, we, we just had a long list last time. This was just prioritizing. As you can see, uh, SIP.js, JSSIP, uh, PJSIP uh, are, uh, you know, sort of the top there. And that'll sort of feed through in a number of questions that were asked. Uh, we also looked in more detail around redundancy. Again, you can see a long list of different approaches. I'm not going to go through that because it would take you know quite a few minutes. Uh, just and again, different implementations have different approaches, but it gives you a good feel for the prioritization that we see across these different uh, methods for supporting redundancy. Now back to cloud and serverless. Uh, so this is really focused on serverless. Uh, again, I mentioned we had um, quite an interesting response from some of the fintech guys uh, looking at us as being sort of Stone Age yaks sh shavers in the telecoms space. But some of the pros uh, we got from asking people, of course, low costs for things that don't need dedicated virtual machines containers. It's good for database, not for VoIP signaling or media processing, pay as you go. No need to manage all the security upgrades and all that stuff. If your application architecture is suitable, you know, there's lots of positive benefits. You know, even if you're just architecting it for serverless and then deploying it on Kubernetes or even your own infrastructure. Uh, you know, of course, scalability, uh, you know, no need for middleware. You know, it's ready for edge, 5G, easy to deploy. You know, great redundancy survivability, therefore, of course, availability. Uh, some are already using, so it's not you know just you know uh, you, the industry is looking on, uh, waiting. Uh, there is active deployment. We're going to look later at the sort of timelines. You know, good in concept, uh, can be useful in the right places for things such as automated testing. So again, you know, a, a interesting review uh, showing sort of uh, the pros and cons. It's hard to architect efficiently with SIP. I think that's coming through strong. We're going to have a uh, panel discussion that'll look into this in a little bit more detail uh, so that we can really understand you know, where are the gotchas? Can they be worked around? You know, can, you know, will we see a sort of slow migration over towards the sort of FinTech model or are we going to see some particular technology barriers being removed uh, or capabilities being added to serverless so that then there's almost like a switch that happens. Hype, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, anything that has a lot of marketing dollars behind it, there's too much hype. Uh, harder for traceability and debugging, that very much uh, comes through time and time again. There are latency issues. There's a complexity explosion in management of DevOps. We've seen that in several deployments. It's, well, I'm not sure it's no proven tech yet uh, or legal issues, but yeah, it, it depends on the country and specifically what you're trying to do. Not ready, I, I agree, for real-time communications. Cost is unpredictable with scale. That is an important issue. And that I think we'll discuss in the panel discussion 
uh, then yeah, more complicated deployments, you know, cost related automation, containerization, O&M, uh, not for telco yet, uh, loss of application control, absolutely. I and mean, that is part of what you're trying to do is reduce uh, the amount of time you have to spend uh, on certain applications and the maintenance and updating and security and all the rest. The difficulty in debug and troubleshoot does come through. Uh, but again, I think for the open source community, that's an opportunity because this is a trend that's not going to go away. I think there are barriers, but from a debug and troubleshooting uh, perspective, I think that's some opportunities. Uh, less features, of course, because you know it's not your own. And then documentation examples is a big gap uh, from the RTC community. Uh, or should I say from Google or Amazon in enabling the RTC community to run on them. What are your plans? Nothing, uh, no plans is the dominant. Evaluating, so people are looking, watching, waiting. And then we've got some that are implementing and you can see it's not wholesale. The industry, open source uh, community have decided and serverless is like, yeah, in places, but it really isn't a yeah, wholesale change at the moment. So that covers the sort of general questions that we asked. Again, I'm gonna share these slides so you get all the numbers. Uh, you can slice and dice uh, any way you uh, like. I'm now filling in some of the gaps because we missed out some projects and I apologize for that. Uh, so we're looking at uh, Draccio, Jambons. Uh, so of course, Jambons is the open source uh, CPAS. Uh, Dave Horton announced that at TAD Summit uh, Asia back in May. And Dratch, of course, is his telecom app server, so it can get used for a whole range of different applications. You can see here the scale uh, of deployment. Of course, you know, as you use the uh, sort of the highest you know, sort of numbers, you're, you're most probably using a SIP router in there. But uh, it's nice to see uh, that's a broad range of applications. Uh, again, looking at project strengths, weaknesses, its future. It's a relatively young project. I mean, the code, the base has been around for a long time. I mean, Dave brings amazing uh, sort of set of experiences, uh, but you know, leverages public cloud computing, auto scaling, top-notch maintainer, aimed at an area of the market that's poorly served. Absolutely. I mean, it's trying to make it you know, sort of more accessible to more developers. And I think this is a very important project for doing that in improving accessibility. Uh, we sort of accuse telcos of being an ivory tower. You know, Open source telecom community can be a little bit of an ivory tower as well. It is relatively new, but it's easy to glue in other projects. I see examples where Draccio and FreeSwitch and Asterix are used, uh, each doing different functions uh, within uh, the deployment. Weaknesses, well, again, it depends when you were popping in and looking at the project. Uh, you know, there are some stacks that aren't there that you see in sort of your other CPAS, but you know, it'll get there. Uh, again, it, you know, it takes time. And that's part of with any open source project. It needs to be around for a while before people build uh, confidence. Uh, it needs to build a community, absolutely. And that's why we're pushing it. We're letting people know about it uh, through uh, TED Summit. Uh, you know, relatively, yeah, I mean, legacy support, again, you know, it's hard with a survey because you you get sort of like a sentence that's put in there and then you know what's behind it of course is far more complex but again you know, all i'm trying to do is give people a feel for the issues that people see around each of the projects of course more documentation i think every project that is true for uh then on the future as you mentioned with the new project it's mixed at the moment some see it as a game changer in cpass likely to be successful others are a little bit more circumspect I think time is critical to confidence in open source projects. So, you know, they need to be proven out in the long term. I think this is a very, you know, interesting project. As you see, it's got some great supporters. And the key is building that community and building out the project over time. And hopefully by bringing in more non-core open source uh, telecom engineers, we can get uh, a broader base of developers driving this project forward. Then uh, WebRTC is uh, the top uh, client that's used there. Uh, this I found was interesting. You know, it, again, sort of, of course, SIP.js and uh, JS SIP. But uh, you know, this year, as you'll see in several of the projects, WebRTC came up uh, as uh, sort of uh, higher up the stack on the client. So that I thought was 
interesting. And again, we need to follow from year to year to see the uh, shifts in how people are uh, using these projects. Then on community, how active, relatively active, how accessible, relatively accessible, uh, how easy to engage, relatively easy, and uh, you're relatively welcome, welcoming, as you would expect with this whole project. If you're, you're willing to contribute, then they're more than happy to uh, you know, sort of accept it. And I think this is a very respectable result given the youth of the project, but also you know, it's testament to the commitment of uh, Dave Horton behind this project. Of course, finding consultants is difficult. It is a more web-friendly approach. It is a little sort of less of a hill to climb uh, compared to some of the other projects, but it still you know, requires uh, some work. Then a little bit more, you know, sort of, even though it's a little bit more web-centric, you can still see, you know, cloud isn't the default option, even though it's a little bit higher than some of the other projects. Uh, Ansible is the answer, of course. Uh, then looking at uh, hybrid versus own versus cloud, you know, again, a little bit more on the cloud than some of the other projects, but it's still very much dominated by yeah, your own infrastructure. On redundancy, a range of approaches. Uh, again, you can read them uh, and the slides will be available so you can look through. Uh, then moving on to uh, RTP engine, this was a gap in the last survey. So this is a proxy for RTP traffic. So, you know, the voice, uh, you know, the actual media that uh, flows through, because of course, SIP is all about the control plane, uh, main applications, PBX, conferencing. Again, RTP Engine is very well established. And you can see it's used at scale and it's very easy to use with both Camera Elio and Open SIPs. So, again, that links to why you see such high scale deployments, strengths, stability, features, quality of the code and the core team. Again, it's been around for the time, it's proven itself. Uh, feature rich, efficient, and of course, integration across the projects. And weaknesses, better documentation. You can see there's a theme here. Uh, monitoring and performance checks could be improved. Ideally, the system you know, would include a turn server. On the future, not expecting any changes, would like plug-in architecture uh, for tapping into the media stream. Of course, you know, SIPWISE you know, is within Alcatel Lucent Enterprise. You know, there's a question around what's going to happen there with the ALE, uh, you know, because there's a lot of consolidation in the industry. And when that consolidation happens, what's going to happen to the project? I mean, as I said, with open source projects, you know, the, you know, the code is always there. So the project never dies. It's just you know, where, whether there's a team supporting it. Uh, so, and you can see, you know, again, you're going to get mixed results in any project, no matter how well established, uh, but you can see a general trend in those responses. On client, again, WebRTC came up more strongly this year, again, with, you know, SIPJS, JS SIP. So again, it just helps you understand, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, sort of popularity of the uh, different clients. And we'll be tracking this over the years to see how that shifts on community. You know, as you can see, uh, sort of, uh, it's more mature. So it doesn't have the activity that we see with uh, Draccio. It's open and active. Uh, you know, it's relatively easy to engage and, uh, you know, they're welcoming in terms of uh, relatively welcoming in taking uh, sort of uh, responses from uh, the community. And as always, <laughs> you know, non-European regions for RTP engine were higher. So you can see within Europe, it was a little easier to find consultants, but outside of Europe, it's harder. Uh, as that's why you see the four and the fives there. In terms of architecting, again, biases towards uh, not cloud. Uh, and this Ansible, as you would imagine, and having the scripts available to make it as easy as possible to get stuff up and running, can't understate the importance there. As you can see, similar result to Dratio. Uh, generally own or hybrid infrastructure with uh, some cloud in there. And similar list, on redundancy, but of course, as you would imagine, uh, Kama Elio in the uh, sort of you know, multi-server setup with uh, you know uh, DNS and service records and or failover that pops up you know uh, quite often. Uh, generally, there's sort of like onesies, twosies. So I couldn't rank these. I just sort of put it as a list. Then we also included uh, a you know, 
ASTPP, that's a smart telephony platform. We did have questionnaires on Yate, Isabel, Silk Server. They didn't have enough responses. So this is the last one in terms of reviewing the projects, looking at what are the main applications it's used for, its scale. As you can see, it's not you know, as high scale as we saw with RTP engine. Strengths, it's powerful, user-friendly, uh, runs on top of free switch. Uh, you know, it's, again, you're gonna get different responses. So, you know, again, you're gonna look at it sort of, you know, squint your eyes a little bit, uh, but you're know, adapted for calling card business only. I'm not sure how true that is, but that's the feedback that we got in future. Anyone can implement an add-on. Uh, you know, other views or its strategy is not so clear. It's trying to reach the wholesale business, but not sure about the architecture technical choices. So again, you know, that's sort of mixed review you see quite often and you see that also in terms of how active vibrant you can see you know because we're getting fewer numbers it, it starts to get you know uh, uh, harder to sort of give a general trend but generally welcoming uh in its approach to uh, add-ons finding consultants not as hard as you saw in some of the other projects uh again because uh, you know it, it's made you know i think uh, relatively easy to build with very much focused on uh, your uh, own infrastructure. But then on hosting, what I found was interesting is uh, it's cl you know, cloud dominate. So I was a little bit confused by those uh, responses there. But again, all I would say is when you get down to like sort of 10 or 12 responses, it gets a little harder, I think, to uh, draw some meaningful answers. And that's why we didn't include for Yate Silk Server uh, or some of the other uh, projects. We also asked a question around FlexiWAN. Should we include it? You know, because it claims to be open source, but you know, it's not available for download anywhere. Answer was a resounding no, so we're not looking at it. Uh, also asked a question around COVID nineteen. Has it impacted your business? Uh, and a mix, and I, that's what I see. You know, in the projects I work on, I think some have been positively. You know, some have uh, not seen any impact. And generally, people have. You know, there's only a few that have been negatively impact because you know maybe they're a small business and they lost one of the key customer accounts. Uh, then, topics we should address for next year. Security definitely came out top. So we'll be gathering. You know, what people want to ask. Uh, people were asking us to repeat the broader survey. They were like, well, why are you asking about these weird little projects? Why aren't you asking about Asterix and you know all these other big projects? And it's like, well, we did last year. We're just filling in some gaps. Uh, but we will, for 2021, do the broader survey. We will ask more details on existing platforms. We'll get feedback on what we should be asking, you know, like API-related features inside Asterix. Uh, more telco stuff. So that was good that we're seeing more uh, people involved that you know are looking at open source software into the uh, telco community. So that was great. Tracking serverless, we had a request to see you know because everybody's watching, but they're circumspect, and they you know, of course you know you make a decision, and then within six months you find that you know a technology's changed or a features or you know capabilities are available that changes the game. Uh, and given the potential savings that some industry verticals have shown through serverless that could change the uh, game there. Uh, also had several requests on trying to get more web developer perspectives, because I'll be honest, this is very biased to the, uh, you know, the open source community. Uh, they're the majority of the people who answer these questions. I think that's something we should look at. I'm not entirely sure how best to do it, uh, but you know, again, we look at how we can uh, get broader perspectives. All I can say is, you know, documentation, documentation, documentation will be one of the big uh, pieces coming out of talking to the web developer community and to make it annual and to track progress over time. If there's anything else, please let me know. Uh, you know, this is a survey that's driven by the uh, community. Okay, so that's the results. The slides are all available online. Now what I'm going to